bottom of the silo. We're about to find out. We are almost to the Lawn Atlas Missile Base just outside of Abilene, Texas. We're meeting Larry Satch Sanders out here. He's the owner of the facility. This is an underground declassified military facility. And the thing I'm most excited to see is this underground silo that is 18 stories deep. And since it's set for 40 years, it's full of water. They stopped the water pumps 40 years ago. So this thing is full of 120 feet of water. It's 185 feet tall. Nobody knows what's at the bottom of the silo. Over the years, people have broken into the facility and we don't know if uh, there might be an urban explorer that got in and couldn't get out because there are no rails or no ladders to get out. And we've also heard rumors that uh, the mob might have come in and dropped off somebody. So we don't know what we're gonna find. We're gonna lower a camera 100 feet down the middle of the silo and see what's at the bottom. If you like history and relics of the past, this episode is for you. All over the world, Texas is known for its love of freedom and tough grit personalities. Larry Satch Sanders is no exception. There's not too many people who can say they own their own missile base. The missile base was declassified in 1965 and is set vacant for over 40 years. Many people don't realize that Texas played a large part in the Cold War by housing several underground missile bases. And since it's filled with water and there are so many mysteries surrounding what's at the bottom, we couldn't wait to send our cameras down. So we finally get to go inside. I'm so excited. If you're standing where I am, you could feel the warm air coming in from outside and the cold air coming up this tunnel from behind me. And we know that there's a silo down at the bottom, but evidently there's a lot of other stuff down there and Larry's about to take us on a tour. I can't wait to check it out. Hey, we're at the Lawn Atlas Missile Base in Abilene, Texas, and we're about to explore an ICBM missile silo. Are you ready? Hang on to your hat. After a tour of the top of the missile base, it was time to go underground. I felt a little like we were stepping into a time portal. This is the entry portal to the Launch Control Center. The Launch Control Center was approximately a story and a half underground. It's a two-story structure attached to the silo. This door represented the structure referred to as the entrapment area. So the crew, when they arrived here, would identify their presence on the phone. This door would be unlocked from a remote location in the launch control center. Then the entire crew would come into the space. That door would lock behind them, and they'd be entrapped in this small space. And then the commander would lift another phone and then exchange code with the commander in place and then they would be allowed to enter the facility. That was also the opportunity if they were under some type of uh, external threat, he could exchange the proper code with the commander in place to notify security and they would be taken care of. And this is where we encountered the two one-ton manganese blast doors. And these doors were always kept in a closed position to guarantee that the crew in the launch control center would never be exposed to radiation or any type of external explosive threat. The one-ton manganese doors, uh, manganese is significant because it has a higher melting temperature and it guaranteed the integrity of the launch control center. Can you try to move it? Yep. Uh, That's but, amazing. Look, you can still move this thing. Now, y'all will notice as we came into the launch control center, we encountered four right angle turns in the structure. By design, those right angle turns serve a very, very important purpose. First of all, every time there's a right angle turn, there's a dramatic reduction of pressure that an explosion can put on our blast doors. 
So we had three right angle turns before we got to the first blast door and then another right angle turn before the second blast door. And the other reason is that radiation can only move in straight lines. It can't make a right angle turn. So the four right angle turns guarantee that in the case of an explosion, the crew could never be exposed to radiation. Let's go ahead downstairs. Satch led the way down to the first floor, the control center of the base. Welcome to the Launch Control Center. And the Launch Control Center was the center of all the activity here and the point where all the control for the launch of the Atlas ICBM occurred. Now you have to kind of use your imagination because this room has been radically changed in its configuration since it was an active site, but everything on this side was dedicated to the actual operation of the missile. So we have a large launch console where the commander sat. All the communications was located here. The power generation station for the diesel power that propelled the system during its launch sequence. Everything happened right here. And there was a crew of five on station. They had two officers and they had three NCOs that were responsible for every aspect of the launch. And that's a phenomenal amount of responsibility, especially when you consider three out of those five were probably under 24 years old. After touring the control center, Satch led us deeper underground. The crew of five that would have been here for their 24-hour shift, I'm sure thought on a regular basis of, well, in the case of a nuclear attack, is this where I will be buried? Uh -huh. And that, it was, that, that thought was eliminated by an emergency escape hatch that the engineers thoughtfully incorporated into the site. So that massive steel door there supported four tons of sand in a tube that goes to the surface. And in the case of a nuclear attack with the entryway being destroyed and the crew wanted to get out of here, they would come over and pull this lanyard device. And by pulling on that, it would unlock the, the door on the emergency escape hatch. Four tons of sand would have fallen to the floor, spread out just like sand's in an hourglass. They would have attached an extension ladder and then they would have climbed out of the launch control center. One of the unique design characteristics of the launch control center is the fact that the two-story building here was hung from the ceiling and there was a massive series of air shocks at four points on this structure that allowed the entire two-story structure to swing free of the external walls. So in the case of a nuclear attack or earthquake or any vibrating causing incident, everything on the floor here would be insulated from that shock. And in fact, when it was operational, you could put your hand on the wall here, push on it hard, and rock the house. So <laughs> this supported two stories. Two stories, exactly. So what you're telling me is that could hold my weight. Absolutely. I've got to test this out for myself. <laughs> Amazing, it does. Oh, goodness. I can't catch That's you. That's great. <laughs> After a tour of the control center, we were finally going to get to see the silo. scary and exciting at the same time. We're standing overhanging this, what, how many feet are we above? It's about 65 feet above the water. About 65 feet above the water. Why is there water in here? Yeah. Well, in the late 60s, when the salvers completed removing the crib, the structure that used to exist inside the silo, the last thing they did was remove the sump pumps from the two sump wells at the bottom and water immediately started coming in and has continued to rise to this day. Well, I can't wait to lower the camera down to the bottom of the silo to see what's down there. No one has been down there for some time, from what I understand, and we're gonna see what's at the bottom. Let's do it. I put these on here temporarily just to hold them in place, and uh, I've got to 
going to take them out, and as soon as we take them out, I've got to turn the lights on, then close them back up and put the zip ties on there. So these are going to be on. They'll last for an hour. So we need to do this. We've got an hour to do it. The clock was ticking, and it was time to get going. We had to assemble the rig right there on site. It was difficult to prepare the equipment with the lights right in my eyes. The lights were blinding. Here's where all of our preparations would come to nothing if we couldn't pull it off. I'm okay. limited amount of time we're racing against the we only have an hour's worth of light on the big lights that we have so we're trying to get these things in as fast as possible so we can use our other lights it's amazing how those things got knocked up i know i think we took the bag and shook them all up on purpose i'm feeling kind of frantic i'm feeling kind of frantic because we're supposed to get these things and we only have so much time. And look, we got these, I'm having to cut it up with this pocket knife down here on this flotilla and get these things thrown in. There. Okay, this one's going in. My favorite knot is the globe hitch because it's obviously named after me. But I'm going to be using the moonter hitch because I didn't bring the rest of the gear down. What I have here is 150 feet of rope that I have marked uh, with a tape at 100 feet. Now I didn't have a mechanism to measure the rope, so I went to the local hardware store. And while no one was looking, I ran it through their machine, and no one ran me off. So I know that this is accurate. We are about to lower the camera down to the bottom and see what's down there. Rachel's going to be monitoring the camera with the iPad and we're going to see. Larry, you ready to do this? Absolutely. As soon as we put the camera in the water, we lost our monitor. And we lost it. There we go.
Now that sounds like a heartbeat, but that's actually the sound of the rope on the edge of the flotilla. I don't want to purposely snag this on anything. The pressure was starting to build, and our lights were only rated to 100 feet. We didn't know how much more they could take. You hear that sound? That's the sound of our lighting case starting to crack. I don't feel it. Now at this point, I could just be piling up rope. If I snag on something. I'm gonna go at least to the hundred foot mark. is a hundred feet. But just before we reached our maximum depth, the bottom came into view. There's no structure except on the wall over here. So maybe five more feet? I think we could do five more feet. Should we do five more feet, Rachel? Yes, we should. We lost our monitor halfway down and didn't know that we had already hit bottom. And more importantly, we didn't realize how dangerously close we were to getting hung up. If we it's bump down. something, okay. It's, down. it's on the bottom. It's down. It's down. There's no weight on it. Okay. Yeah. Let's. Uh... When I tugged on the rope, the rig got lodged, but we didn't even know how perilous the situation was. <laughs> Something's moving down there. I can't see the light any longer. Pitch dark. You know, probably disturbed whatever's down there or awoken. Awoken down there. As we were joking around up top, the situation below was getting worse. 100% of your dying have that death. You know what we're going to find when and it comes back that, up? There's going to be a skeleton hand hanging on to so that it. That is your ascending But when I started to pull up the rig, it came free.
Wow, what an experience. Can you believe we almost lost our camera? Had I known we were going to come so close to losing the camera, I wouldn't have done it. Yes, I would, because it was cool. Yes, it was. What did you see? I saw a dead body. You saw a ladder. It was under the ladder. What did you see? 